Hey everyone! So as a bit of a follow-up to my last video, today I want to talk to you about marriage. But before that, I'm going to introduce you to my little helper for the day. His full name is Sir Thomas Claude Barrington, but you can call him Tommy. Isn't he a little cutie with his little bow tie? He's so smart. You see, bitch. Anyway, so like the last video, this isn't exactly in response to anything that William Lane Craig has said, but it was inspired by a couple of things I've heard him say. These things. I think that if the United States um, ratifies same-sex marriage, it will have so fundamentally redefined what marriage is that it will be a cultural watershed um, for this country and represent just a further drift away from um, traditional values. She's not dealing with the issue that I think is even more fundamental namely that marriage by its very nature is a union that is heterosexual. There, there is no such thing as a same-sex marriage. It, it uh, is essentially a heterosexual union. And these statements did get me thinking a lot, particularly all the way back to when I was studying sociology at A-level. It was one of my favourite subjects and one of my favourite modules, which I got full marks in, just, just gonna throw that out there. Um, so one of my favourite modules was about the family and relationships in society. We didn't quite go into the history, um, you know, of marriage in the same amount of details I'm going to go into today, but one of the big ideas that we covered repeatedly throughout the module and throughout other modules as well was this idea of nature versus nurture, which I'm sure is something you've all thought about or learnt about at some point. So in the context of the family, for example, yes, humans have certain biological reasons for forming groups. People have certain biological urges to have kids and reproduce. The brain subconsciously recognises the difference between in and out group members, we naturally feel empathy for others, and so on. So for this reason, it can be said that we form groups or families or relationships for a natural biological reason. However, the idea of a natural family group in name and as it is defined is definitely a social construct, as is marriage. Another example would be childhood. In different parts of the world and throughout different times in history, the definition of what childhood is has changed. I touched on this in another one of my videos and a lot of people were quick to jump on and say, no, no, childhood is biological. But I'd like to put a slightly different argument forwards. In some cases throughout history in the past, Childhood was simply said to end as soon as the kid was able to function by themselves. They could feed themselves, they could dress themselves, they could walk around, they could even go to work. In some societies, children as young as six or seven were expected to go work as chimney sweeps in factories on farm. That was when childhood ended. In other cases, it was tied directly to puberty. So as soon as a girl hit puberty and was able to have babies, she was expected to get married and start popping them out. In those cases, childhood ended at 12 or 13. Today in the UK, it's probably thought that childhood might end around 16, because that's when we don't legally have to go to school anymore. That's when you can go off to college or sixth form or start an apprenticeship and so on. And 16 is the legal age of consent. So maybe that's when childhood ends. Although some people may be more inclined to say that childhood ends at 18, which is when we're most likely to move out of our parents' houses and go away to uni. It's the age you can legally buy alcohol, get married without a parent's consent. It's the age you can buy cigarettes. It's the age you can gamble. On the other hand, in America, maybe childhood ends at 18 because that's when you finish school. Or perhaps it's 21 because that's the age when you can buy alcohol. What I'm saying is that while childhood is linked to biology in some ways, its definition is still predominantly a social construct and it has changed throughout history. And marriage is the same. Marriage has never been the same throughout history and in all different societies. This got me questioning some of William Craig's statements a little bit. I mean, how can a man-made concept naturally be anything? If it was created by people, if it was defined by people, then surely, like any man-made social construct, it can change, it can adapt, it can grow, its definition can be altered. But before we answer any of those questions, I want to take a brief look at the history of marriage. Now obviously I can't cover everything, some bits are going to be left out, but I'm going to talk about as much as I possibly can. Another thing to note is I'm not actually touching on divorce in this, even though that is a huge influence. I just kind of want to talk a little bit about 
what marriage is and why we came to think of it in the way we do today. So it is believed that between two and five million years ago, the first kind of people, the first humans, as basic as we were, didn't really have much of a use for marriage. Research suggests that people were pretty promiscuous. Both males and females had sex with multiple partners, presumably in the hopes of increasing the chance of pregnancy and continuing the species. There's even evidence of things like food being exchanged for sexual favours, sometimes even between same-sex partners. So, homosexuality? Yeah, it's a pretty natural thing. It's been going on for literally millions of years. Because of the diet and how food was gathered, and the fact that, you know, we were eating mostly plants and vegetables, women didn't really need males to protect them so much. And even the kind of babies they had were a lot more self-sufficient, I guess, than the kinds of babies we have today. They were a lot more developed when they were born. So even when women were pregnant, and even when they'd just given birth, they were all right, they could still look after themselves, they could still collect food for themselves, and they didn't really need the men to protect them all that much. So basically, there wasn't much of a need for committed partnerships, so people just went around with whoever they fancied at the time. But things changed. The climate changed, the environments changed, diet changed. Meat was being eaten increasingly often, and this actually had quite a bit of an impact on our physiology. For one thing, our brains grew and we became more developed. It also impacted when women gave birth and what the babies were like. Women actually started to give birth earlier when the babies were less developed. But anyway, all of this changed how groups interacted with each other. Tools began to be developed, um, hunting for meat was more common, and as babies started to need more care, it just kind of happened that women started to stay at home with the kids a little bit more because they were less able to go out and hunt. They couldn't protect themselves and the babies anymore at the same time. So the men began to step in. They became the hunters and gatherers, the protectors. And the women grouped together to look after babies and small children who couldn't quite fend for themselves yet. So at this point, between about 23,000 years ago and 1.8 million years ago, sort of partnerships began to form. But at this point, it was all centered around survival. It's found that the couples who stayed together for the first three to four years after a baby was born, they would have a kid and raise it together and look after it, they'd protect it, they'd feed it all together in a couple. It was shown that in those circumstances, the kid was more likely to survive than when a woman was just left alone to raise it. But after three to four years, the kid was fine, it was probably gonna stay alive anyway, so the couple would separate, wander off, and find new partners to have more kids with. But these were partnerships of convenience, they were partnerships centered around safety, and they were partnerships centered around survival, and trying to make sure their species and their genes continued and were passed on. Then, 23,000 years ago, things started to change as humans began growing their own food. Farming, essentially. At this point, it was found that, for the time at least, the most productive family units were the ones who, you know, they had an adult male, they had an adult female, they had kids together, they divided their tasks and everyone took on their own roles. This was the best way to be productive, it was the best way to produce the highest amount of food. Thanks to biological difference, men were more likely to go out and do the farming, do the hunting, while women stayed home to look after the children. So this is a time when we naturally see gender roles forming, and when we get the first idea of kind of family units. So these long-term unions between men and women became more common around this time, and they started to be recognised within the communities. Essentially, these were the first marriages, even though they weren't exactly official. But it wasn't just about bringing a man and woman together to have kids. This had been happening for years without marriage, right? It was more about encouraging long-term bonds, because it was useful for society as a whole. Instead of the man and woman wandering off after three or four years, if they stuck together, you know, in this long-term partnership, they were more likely to have children who survived, they were more likely to have a successful farm, and they were more productive than just individuals in a society on their own. Much, much later on in the future, legal aspects began to be introduced to, you know, protect bloodlines, share assets, give men the assurance that the kids they were raising were actually their own, and give women a little bit of an insurance policy so they wouldn't just get pregnant and be left alone. This meant they could concentrate on actually, you know, raising the kids without worrying that the guy was just gonna find a younger, hotter model, you know? Around this time, marriage became strategic. Families would pair up their kids, sometimes even before they were born, and marry them off to strengthen bonds, alliances, it was all political, it was all economic. Because of this, actual marriages, you know, like legally binding unions, 
These started off as an entirely civil institution, particularly in Europe. At this point, it's important to note that in different cultures, marriage wasn't actually just between one man and one woman. Polygamy was pretty common in some places. In most cases, it was one man with several wives. One fa thing I found interesting was back in ancient Rome, Native America, and even some African and Asian cultures, there was a trend of these same-sex unions taking place. Now, in some cases, this was essentially like a same-sex relationship in that they would have sex together, they would have a life together and this sort of thing, but it was also sometimes for business re reasons, for legal reasons. It was to form partnerships and strengthen family ties. There were lots of reasons, but essentially same-sex unions were very, very commonplace. And in fact, sexual relationships between two men or two women was also common, it was accepted. Up until the 13th century, male bonding ceremonies were pretty much the same as any of the marriage ceremonies. They had the same aspects to them, they led to the same outcomes, they had the same legal kind of requirements and things like that. They took place throughout the Mediterranean and they were really, really common. Then the Roman Catholic Church decided it wanted to step in. It wanted in on the action. Around the 12th century, marriage started to be referred to as a sacrament by the church. In the 16th century, they declared that marriage was, was sacred and that the marriage ceremony should only be performed in public by a priest and with a witness present and God. God had to witness as well. In fact, it was religion getting involved in the first place that banned these same-sex unions. Like in 1306, the Byzantine emperor decided that same-sex unions were unchristian. He didn't like them, he didn't want them, so he banned them along with incest and sorcery because they're all the same, aren't they? But later things start to look up. Marriage became more about love, more about romance, particularly during the Victorian era. This was the time when dating became a thing, or courtship, as they like to call it. And people actually decided that, you know what, it would be a good idea for this marriage if we actually liked each other beforehand. According to one website, there were three stages to a Victorian relationship. Stage one was courting. Apparently, dating would first begin when a couple began to speak to one another. The woman had to be introduced to the man first, she couldn't just go up and speak to him. And then, if they liked each other on that first meeting, they'd go out for walks, and lastly, they would be keeping company together just meant they were chaperoned and they were meeting each other, they were talking, you know, getting to know each other. Step two was engagement. If they had developed a mutual affection, you know, basically they realised they got on and kind of liked each other, then they got engaged and the couple could hold hands in public, they could go for walks alone and take unchaperoned rides. Pretty scandalous, right? Then they would be married. And, you know, marriage was one thing and the woman would play the role of the dutiful wife and mother and all of her property and assets and everything would automatically be transferred to the husband. Okay, maybe there was still some legal and political reasons to it, but on the whole, love and romance was starting to be introduced. It was getting a little bit more common, it was nice. However, there were still rules about, you know, you had to marry within the same class as you and so on. But over the years, the rules got more lenient, just as the class system got more lenient and kind of started to fade away. 20th century marriage shifted the focus to be primarily about love, about companionship, and it was less about marrying for assets or politics or the economics or whatever. And as the reasons for marriage changed, the legalities around marriage changed too. Just some examples. In 1929, the age of marriage increased to 16 with parental consent and 18 without it in the UK. And it's stayed that way ever since. Before this, boys could get married as young as 14 and girls at 12. This is the first hint of people kind of you know, realising that that is too young, that those kids are probably going to be emotionally traumatised and they're not adapted well enough to deal with the emotions, the consequences, the physical aspects of an adult relationship. Another example, in the US, up until 1967, interracial marriage was illegal. Thankfully, some states had started to repeal it before then, but it wasn't until 67 when it was legal in all states. Up until 1991, it wasn't illegal to rape your spouse in the UK. Thankfully, this was abolished. <laughs> so the point is, we have lots of different reasons for getting married today. There's lots of different laws around it. The definition of marriage has changed. The reasons for getting married has changed. Sometimes it is still financial or political or legal. Sometimes it is for religious reasons. And most of the time, it's for love. 
and I think that's great. The moral of this story is that marriage has never just been one single thing. The idea of what marriage is, is all been decided by its societies in general, and it's still different from one society to another today. Our personal, social and legal definitions are always changing, and that's not a bad thing. The people who cry out that marriage has always been between one man and one woman, or the people who cry out that heterosexual marriage is only natural, are clearly uninformed on the history of marriage and just the history of human relationships in general, because that is not true at all. Now, I'm not saying we should just let anyone get married whenever, wherever, whyever they want, because, you know, we do have things like the legal age of consent for a reason, and the age when you can get married. That's there for a reason. Those laws are in place to protect children from physical and emotional harm. Obviously, they're a good thing, but that is on a completely different level to, you know, people of different or the same genders getting married. That does no harm. I mean, let's be honest, if two men or two women who love each other get married, who is that really hurting? I've had people quote statistics to me before about how gay men are more likely to commit suicide, or gay people are more likely to have STDs, or gay people are more likely to this, or this, or this, or whatever. But do you guys really think that's some inherent feature of being gay? And even if it was, why does that mean we should deny them marriage? More than just being gay influences those people. How about the effect of facing stigma, abuse, being denied rights by society? Surely that's going to make someone feel a bit down, depressed, perhaps suicidal. I think if those numbers are accurate, it's more telling about how certain societies need to be more accepting, offer more help to people, rather than just denying them anything and treating them as lesser. Let's be honest for a moment, right? If I have any people watching this video who do oppose gay marriage, let me ask you a question. Or a couple of questions. When me and my boyfriend Dan get married, how is that going to affect you? How is that going to affect the people around you? How is that going to have any effect on this society? On your life? You know, it could be a good or a bad effect, but how is it going to affect anyone in this world other than me and Dan? Okay, you thought about that? And now another question. My sister got married last year, just, just over a year ago now, and she's been with her partner for a long time. Like, I can't even talk how long, because I was so young when they met. Maybe it was like 15 years, maybe more, I don't know. Basically so long that her wife, Charlotte, basically just feels like another sister to me. Honestly, I think they're pretty much the perfect couple. Charlotte brings out the fun side in Sarah Jane when Sarah Jane can get too anxious and worry sometimes, and Sarah Jane kind of calms Charlotte down and makes her be a little bit more sensible and responsible. Um, but they still have fun together, they support each other, they look after each other, they bring out the best in each other. And I mean, what more could I want for my sister, who is one of the most incredible people I know, right? But after all that, my question to you is, how did their marriage affect you? The fact that my sister married a woman, what big terrible thing did that change? Let's look at the difference between this moment and this moment. What's the difference there? What changed other than them signing a bit of paper? Why is one of these so much worse than the other to you? I'd like you to name one, one person who was affected badly by their marriage. Just try, because I can't think of a single one. And I just have to say to so anyone who finds himself questioning the validity of gay marriage, or any time you find yourself feeling hateful or angry about the fact that gay marriage is legal now, I just want you to think for a moment about what the actual effect of gay marriage is. Because allowing it really doesn't hurt anyone, does it? But not allowing it, you're withholding basic rights from actual people. You're telling them that their relationship isn't worth as much as another relationship. And that's horrible, that's hurtful. You're taking something away from them, and for what reason, really? Because I can't logically think of a reason why you'd want to deny them that. But anyway, that is just a little, little rant of mine. Huge thanks to Tommy for looking smart in the background throughout this whole video. He's a wonderful little co-host. But anyway, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Let me know them down in the comments. If you've made it through this far, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. I'll see you again soon.